Welcome back to Hoffman Tactical. In today's video, I'm going to be sharing my thoughts on the Sovol SV04 IDEX 3D printer. This little guy right there. Full disclosure, Sovol did reach out to me requesting that I do a review, and they sent me the printer free of charge. This will probably soften up my review a little bit, but I'll try to be as unbiased as I can. I am not going to do a detailed unboxing or list off all the specs, because I think you can find that easily elsewhere. I want to focus on the printer's strong and weak points and whether it's right for you. The printer did come well packed and it was very easy to assemble. It requires about 30 inches by 30 inches of desk space, so you'll want to have enough room set aside to fit this machine. The largest features of this printer is that it has two extruders mounted on the X axis, each driven by its own stepper motor. This allows you to print with two different filaments or even two different nozzle sizes, which has a lot of possible applications. The, this type of printer is called an IDEX or Independent Dual Extruder Printer. Other than being an IDEX, the other attractive features of this 3D printer are direct drive extruders, auto bed leveling, dual Z-axis lead screws, filament runout detection, and auto recovery after power loss. Something that this printer is missing is all metal hot ends. The nozzles can only reach 260 degrees Celsius, which limits how many functional materials you can print with. Sovol does have a heat break upgrade you can add to fix this, but I've not used it yet and I don't know how hard the needed firmware changes will be to allow the hot ends to reach their full temperature. However, it is an option that will probably allow you to print with a full gamut of mechanical materials. The SV04 is built much like an Ender 3, Mendel-style bed slinger built with aluminum extrusions and Delrin rollers. It is a solid build. There is a touchscreen interface that allows control over the machine. Sovol has a fork of Cura available for this printer that does work, kind of. I set up a Prusa Slicer profile, more on that later. Being an IDEX allows two color prints, such as this F14 model, or this Octopus. It is pretty cool. You can also print with two unleaded filaments, such as this PLA Plus pistol grip with a rubberized TPU texture. There are a lot of possible applications. Something to keep in mind is that IDEX printing is not as simple as you might think. In many cases, parts must be designed specifically for IDEX printing, such as in the case of the rubberized pistol grip. Prusa Slicer does have a function to paint on colors, but it does not control how the slicer prints internally and is not good for many structural or rubberized parts. To give you a better idea of what I mean, here's a quick primer on how IDEX printing works. Paint on color aside, the slicer has to know which areas of your part need to be printed with each print head. The way it does this is by breaking the part up into bodies and then slicing each body for all practical purposes as a separate part. In fact, the IDEX printer prints each body as a separate part. It simply uses the tool change command to swap back and forth between each hot end. Now the slicer can't break the part up. You have to do this during the design stage. Two mesh files must be imported into the slicer and a tool head assigned to each one. I will show you how I did this for the pistol grip. In SOLIDWORKS, the CAD design software I use, I designed the grip. Once that was completed, I used surface modeling to cut the grip area away from the rest of the grip and made it a separate body inside the same part. This left me with a core grip body and the texture body. I then applied the texture and exported each body as a separate SDL file. These files could then be imported into the slicer and printed. Keep this in mind when you're thinking about an IDEX printer. There can be a lot that goes into printing IDEX parts properly. Let's talk about the things I don't like about this printer. Unfortunately, there were quite a few. The extruders are geared to give the stepper motors more torque. However, there is only one extruder gear pushing the filament and it's not even profiled. This is exactly like the Ender 3. During my testing of the printer, I never had the stepper motor slip. The extruder gear would always start slipping and grinding on the filament first. In my opinion, a geared extruder without a dual drive extruder gears is a bit of a waste. Larger dual drive gears like those found on many newer printers would have been really, really nice on this machine. The filament runout sensors are not placed on the extruder like with other printers such as the Prusa MK3. This means there is quite a bit of wasted filament on spool changes and you can't use the, the sensor for automatic filament loading. Even worse, the filament sensor tends to snag on the filament during loading and won't work well with TPU. I feel as if the sensors were added as an afterthought and are not well integrated. I ended up unplugging the sensors and just ran without them. You can't modify the flow during a print. This is a feature I would really like to see. Also, you can't adjust the steps per millimeter via the interface, so you will need to use Printerface or load custom G-code via this SD card to update them. 
The dual Z-axis lead screws are essential on a printer of this size. Each is driven by a separate stepper motor and feature anti-backlash brass nuts. However, there is a problem with the design, and after the printer is powered off, the screws can be turned under the weight of the X-axis, and the axis can be misaligned if one screw turns more than the other. When you first set up the printer, you must manually level the X-axis using the two provided spacers. After this, you can then level the bed, and then in the future, if the axis becomes misaligned, you can run the auto X-axis leveling routine, which will align the X-axis with the bed, which you hope is still level. However, there's a catch. There is no way of determining if the Z-axis is misaligned or not. The Prusa MK MK3 printer also features dual lead screws, and during the bed leveling, this is run at the start of each print. The print can detect the axis is misaligned, and if it is, it will automatically align the axis by driving it into the Z-stops at the top of the travel. On the SVO4, the printer cannot detect a problem, let alone solve it. I have been printing smaller parts where a bit of misalignment won't be a problem, and I've been careful not to shift or move the printer around in a way that would cause the Z-axis to move and become misaligned. I think the best way to fix this is to add a timing belt between the two Z screws at the top of the printer. This should not cost very much and would ensure the screws remain aligned. To be fair, with a bit of care, this is not a huge issue, but if I were using this printer day in and day out for prototyping and production, it would be a real pain. Better firmware could fix this, much like the Prusa does. The auto bed leveling is only partly automatic. Like with the Ender printers that have been upgraded with the BL Touch, the bed must still be manually leveled. Then the mesh bed leveling can be run to compensate for waviness in the bed and any minor errors left over from the manual leveling process. This is not a very robust solution and it took me a few tries to get it all adjusted so that I could get a good first layer. The manual x-axis leveling did not help with this, and in the end, the first layers are not perfect, but definitely good enough to get prints. The stock bed that came with the SV04 was pretty bad. One of those softer plastic coated beds with a really aggressive texture. Parts were hard to remove, and getting a good first layer was tricky. I ended up throwing one of my powder coated Prusa steel beds on, which worked much better. You can get other beds for the SV04 that are not too expensive, so it's pretty easy to fix. The cable management works and is pretty robust, but it could be a lot neater. My overall impression of the SV04 is that it is built like an upgraded Ender 3. Systems are not well thought out and it requires tinkering to get good results. But to be clear, the construction is a lot more solid than your ordinary Ender 3 printer. Okay, with the negatives out of the way, let's talk about the included slicer and why I moved to Prusa Slicer and the challenges that brought. The Sovol Slicer is based on Cura and is pretty slow for some reason. I also had issues changing part orientation for multi-body parts. Also, they have not optimized the tool change or start G-code for IDEX printing. When the tool change command is called, it would simply park and cool down the active nozzle and then heat up and begin printing with the next nozzle. No account was taken for the oozing during the time the nozzle was parked. I decided to set up a Prusa Slicer profile, which was a lot more trouble than I thought. Without going into too much detail here, the software end stops for the X-axis prevented me from working with a left nozzle when it was parked. Since you can't edit end stops in G-code, I ended up using the M211 command to disable them. If you were interested in how I set up my Prusa Slicer with the SV04, let me know and I may do a video on it. In the end, I got the slicer to retract the filament, park, and cool down the nozzle, and then properly purge the new nozzle before printing with it. I experimented with lifting the Z-axis every tool change, which would increase print reliability, but res found it resulted in too many problems. I printed calibration bars for all three axes of motion. They were close, but not perfect. I used Pronter Face to adjust the steps per millimeter to dial in the accuracy. Now, this is a good time to bring up another problem with this printer. One shared by the Ender 3 and similar lower cost machines. A lack of skew compensation. Because of the printer's Z carriage design, it is not naturally squaring. In other words, the Z axis may not be perpendicular with the bed. Same with the Y axis. It may not be perpendicular with the X axis. During assembly, I did my best to ensure that the frame was square and true, but this can only be done so well. On my Ender, for example, the bed is not perfectly square with the X axis. This results in skewed prints, which can become a problem with larger parts. This can be compensated for in firmware, but the stock firmware on the Sovol SV04, like the Ender's stock firmware, does not have this enabled. I will probably reflash the firmware at some point to add this, but it's an important feature that a lot of manufacturers are overlooking. Moving on, I also had a lot of under extrusion, and when I did E-step calibration, I found that the hot ends were under extruding by about 10%. Adjusting the steps per millimeter cleaned this up, mostly. 
I still think we have an under extrusion issue at higher print speeds due to the poor extruder design, but keeping the flow rate under 5 millimeters per second makes it a non-issue. I did try and conduct a CNC kitchen style flow test, but found that my scale was not nearly precise enough. So that will have to wait until I get a better scale. The one other calibration print I did was the extruder offset calibration. Sovil includes some files that can be used for this, but I found them hard to use. I ended up designing this simple print that can be measured with calipers to find out exactly how much the offset needs to be adjusted so that both nozzles on both hot ends are printing on the same coordinate plane so that they can actually print parts together and have all the seams line up properly. Once all of this was done, I actually got a really nice 3D Benchy print on in single extruder mode. I have also been using the SVO4 in copy mode to print the little TPU hose clamp covers I ship in my kits. It actually does a really nice job of this. Both no nozzles move in unison to print two parts at once, which is cool, but of course not the main attraction of using an IDEX printer, as you would be better off with two separate single extruder printers. It also has a mirror mode, but I don't see the utility of this. The 3D Benchy I printed in single extruder mode did come out really nice and doesn't have very many print flaws. It's got a pretty smooth surface and I was pretty impressed. Unfortunately, I'm still having issues in dual mode where I'm using two different filaments on the same part. As you can see on the pistol grip, there is inconsistent extrusion and Z banding. This was with Prusa Slicer. I also need to work out my retraction and play around with the Z hop a little more. I tuned Z hop off in the hopes it would help eliminate the Z banding issues. It may have helped a little, but not much. When parts are sliced with Sovil's version of Cura, it gets really weird. I sliced a multicolor octopus and in both Cura and Prusa Slicer for comparison. This one was printed with Prusa. You can see that there are still quite a few print defects. The seams need to be cleaned up some and extrusion is not completely consistent. There are also some small blobs on the surface due to minor problems with tool change settings. Strings of filament from the purge buckets can become stuck to the nozzle and pulled onto the print. This is mostly a problem when the bucket becomes full. Redesigning the buckets to allow the filament strings to fall free down a chute would be probably fix this. This octopus was sliced with Sovil's version of Cura. The seams are much crispier and I think the retraction settings are dialed in better than my Prusa profile. But there are more gaps in layers caused by poor tool change settings. However, the largest problem is the way the layers stack. Zooming in, you can see how the part sliced in Prusa looks at the layer lines. Pretty normal. This is the part sliced in Cura. The layers are in pairs, stacked one on top of the other, basically making the layer height 0.4 millimeters instead of 0.2 millimeters. This is weird. Slicers, in order to reduce tool changes, print two layers with the same nozzle before swapping to the other tool head. It must be a bug in Sovil's Cura where it stacks these two layers directly on top of each other instead of following the profile of the part. I don't know if this is a Cura problem or specific to Sovil's version. Either way, I do not recommend using the included Sovil slicer for dual mode printing. There were a few things about the printer I really liked. The stepper drivers are really quiet. So quiet that I can't tell when the printer starts from across the room. Much better than my Prusa MK3 printers. The fans are a bit louder, but not too bad. I was just super impressed by actually how quiet those stepper motors were. While the Y-axis is an Ender 3 style, it does run in a wider 40mm extrusion with six Delrin rollers. This results in a nice sturdy bed, much better than on an Ender 3. The touchscreen interface does work quite well. It is responsive and has not lagged or hung up during use. G-code is loaded via standard SD card, which I like better than the micro SD card used by other printers. Power loss recovery did work. I was able to test it a couple times inadvertently. Once it recovered perfectly and the next time it did not because the Z-axis had dropped some. But power panic is never that good in, on any machine. The large size is a neutral for me. I understand that some people will want to be able to print big objects but almost everything I do is intended to print on a Prusa or Ender 3 printer, so I would prefer a smaller footprint and a more compact printer, but that's up to your preference. Bigger is not always better. The belt tensioners are also really easy to use, much better than the Ender or even the Prusa belt tensioning systems. I found them very easy to use. There are a number of things I did not touch on in this review because I felt they were not that important, or the information was available elsewhere in a better format than I could produce. I think there is a lot of improvement that could and hopefully will be done on the slicer and firmware side of IDEX printing. At this point, IDEX printing is pretty crude and additional features and capability will make it a lot more useful. 
In summary, I think this is a great printer to learn about IDEX printing, especially considering its sub $500 price tag. I have learned a lot and will be creating more content with this machine in the future as I do more with it. However, because of its lack of design integration and the issues that I have had with setting it up and with print quality, I would not recommend this as a first printer and would not recommend this if you need a machine that just works and does not require tinkering. With that said, many of you are much smarter than me and would probably have no issues setting this up and getting great prints. I hope you found today's video helpful and I will catch you guys again later. Thank you so much for watching.